welcome everybody to this uh, Tuesday, the 31st of August's uh, Edinburgh Civic Forum kind of meeting is we usually on the first Tuesday of the month, but because that September date a bit further along, we thought of kind of hosting it today. Um, we do have a number of apologies. People kind of are on holiday or kind of away yeah. because clearly the um, uh, the English kind of holidays are still still kicking in and people are taking advantage of that. Um, hence the reason why we want to record it so people can share um, our discussions, um, uh, you know, can, can enjoy them later on or share them with their colleagues. So um, almost without any further ado to me, I'll hand over to, to um, the chairman of the Coburn, Professor Cliff Haig. What I would ask you to do just before I do so, if you haven't done so, um, is to certainly turn your microphone kind of off, because otherwise we get an awful lot of kind of background noise. Keep your kind of video on unless you want to kind of turn it off. Um, that's fine. And um, use either the raise the hand function if you if you know that that's certainly if you hover over your own image. There's kind of three dots um, at the top as a reminder, and you could, you know, I think wave your hand that way, or using the um, the functions kind of elsewhere, or just wave kind of kind of madly. <clears throat> what is also quite useful to do too um, is if you're just making kind of a point in the running kind of kind of um, discussions, use the kind of chat function. You know, just kind of write stuff down. People are kind of doing that kind of kind of already. Uh, and that's a useful way for us recording kind of other input too. Um, so that's me, uh, I'll hand over to Cliff. Cliff. Okay, thanks Terry, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming along this evening. Uh, <laughs> can we just get a note of the apologies, Terry? You made reference to some. You seem to be muted. God, there we go, schoolboy error. I don't have them kind of immediately to kind of hand okay. because they've been coming in through the day. So, 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 so you were studiously vague about it then? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm sure they can be retrospectively ruled in there. So, so that that's fairly quickly dispensed with item one. Item two is the minutes of the last meeting. So, can we just um, go for accuracy first of all? And uh, to my great delight, I found one or two little niggles in there if I could just um, go through you, you know I always like to be pedantic like this um, so yeah just before th section three uh, CH thanks David for his clear and open approach and look forward to the continued pos position relationship between him and the forum I guess it should be positive and the next one I got, I'll let others have a go later. I think this isn't really an error. I think this is me mis mispronouncing, misstating something, but at the top of page three, it says buy to let developments. And I think I, I think it was me, and I think I really meant build to rent uh, developments. And then finally, I think at the end of those bullet points, um, implications of COVID for higher education institutions should be higher education institutions. I've still got a, a matter arising, but has anybody else got any um, factual corrections to those minutes at this point? Is it purely me that's, uh, that's niggled like this? I always have one or two in just to keep you happy, Chair. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> okay, um, matters arising that we're not covering elsewhere. And the only one I wanted to pick mm -hmm. up, which is really uh, to David, I just got to go back along to it, um, was the, let me just go back. Yeah, in, in the list of bullet points under David's contribution last time, um, three from the bottom, there was a request for an organogram for the place director, and, and that was noted. I don't know, David, if if it's possible to um, you know, progress on that. I think it was really yeah, just yeah. people wanted to get an idea around who, who to contact in whatever circumstances. Yeah, I've actually got um, a, a service diagram that I can send over this evening for planning, which shows, because I think it was, I'd taken away the action as if it was planning, but I can I can look at the wider 
place directorate, but I suspect that most members of the forum are possibly more interested in planning it. If that's, I don't know if that's fair, but I can send that over this evening and we can see if that's if that's useful or if you're if you're wanting more information. Okay, thank you. Any comment on that at this stage? Are you happy with planning or do people want place? Yeah. Nobody seems to be jumping up and down that I can see. So maybe you, you just stick with the planning, as you say, David, and then if, if people require further, they, they can ask for it. So I'll shut up at that point. Or oh, somebody, somebody might purchase saying saying he would prefer the whole of place. To, to be honest, I, I guess the place is a, a big directorate that includes everything from parks and bins and... Um, all sorts of different uh, service areas. Um, so I can, I, I, if I can just have a wee reflection on that, what's what's useful to send and, and see if we've got something that, that's handy, I can certainly do that. But I'll get the planning one over it in any case uh, just now because I've got that ready. That's great. Th thanks very much, David. And, and are you content with that, Mike, for now? Yeah. Just, yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other matters arising that anybody else had spot? spot? <clears throat> Is that just Peter? yeah, Terry? <clears throat> um, in, in case it doesn't come up, kind of, kind of elsewhere, is in the report where we talked um, in the last meeting about the outdoor seating for hospitality. Um, there's certainly been reports in the press about um, many of these things needing to come down in September, and I was just wondering if there was any any process for. Um, um, the hospitality sector to appeal against that and if there was an appeal process then how people might be engaged in that or well, that may be a licensing issue which you may need to reflect upon do you want me to come in on that terry yeah yeah, please, sure. yeah um so that is something that we're looking at at the moment so we've got uh, there's different pieces of advice from government about what is uh should um be allowed or uh, put in place at, at, at the moment. Um, as far as the planning system is concerned, the government's advice remains in place that we should continue to take a, a relaxed approach to um, planning enforcement around these types of um, installations. Um, so we're, we're looking at um, that September date at the moment with uh, colleagues uh, who deal with the, the road permits and also uh, with, with licensing. Um, and if if required, we'll, we'll bring forward a, a report to the, the appropriate committee in the council so there's some oversight uh, over uh, uh, any decisions around all of all of that. But we're, we're very conscious that, um, you know, many of the businesses are, I think, quite dependent on uh, these types of installations at the moment because people are still, uh, the, the feedback we're hearing is that people are still social distancing. They're not wanting necessarily to be in as crowded places uh, as they might have done uh, previously, um, so the the to, to you know to get the, the sort of patronage they need to sustain their businesses, uh, some of these uh, places do require um, some additional uh, some additional space. But we're also conscious that the there is a there's a, a sort of wider um, sort of community uh, interest aspect to it because uh, the the installations are using street space and. Uh, there are issues that can arise around all of that. So it's something that is a, is a matter I think we, we need to look at carefully. It's something that where we need to sort of balance the needs of, int of, of businesses um, with, those of the, uh, with those of the community. But as I say, um, I, I suspect we'll be bringing a report back to a council committee to, so that there is some councillor over, oversight over whatever it is we uh, decide to do around all of that. Okay, any further matters arising? I can't see everybody on the screen, but um, is anybody else spotting anything? No? So anyway, that, that perhaps provides us a, a nice point to shift into the next item, which is David's um, general planning update report. Thanks, Cliff. So there was a, f a few things, a um, couple of things from last time uh, in a in addition to the service diagram, I think uh, I'd undertaken to 
um, look at the issue of site notices. So uh, my colleagues are looking at that at the moment to see if we can make these a little bit more accessible in terms of the way that they're written, because they are written, they do have to comply with legislation, but I'm also conscious uh, that, that sometimes they, they can be a bit of, they can be a wee bit difficult to read because the, you know, the, the sort of most important aspects of them maybe aren't at the fore. So we're looking at that. We're also looking at, I think there was a question about um, how they are displayed and could we use plastic paper or uh, such like at the moment we we use ups um, or we are we intend or we should be using upside down poly pockets and I think the comment maybe from last time was that uh, one of these had been installed uh, the the right way up as it were which means that obviously the rain gets into it so yeah there's a little detail we're just going to be we're going to be looking at uh, that um, the other thing was um, in relation to commenting on planning applications there's been a query about um, how you can track planning applications. There's actually a feature that's built into the planning portal for that, and we've got some guidance. So I'll forward that on to Terry just now with the, um, the service diagram, and you can have a look at that. But once you're into the portal, there's a way of setting it up so that you can record um, your, you, you can effectively repeat your search and get kind of feedback uh, automatically from the search criteria that you put in. So if you want to search for particular types of applications, or if you want to search for applications in a particular area, I think it's able to feed, feed you those through your um, email uh, system. Other two things I wanted to cover were uh, city plan. Uh, can't really comment on city plan before it is um, into the public domain. Um, but what I would say is we are now moving forward with the very final stages of it. So it's a kind of uh, watch this space comment. Uh, it will be coming. Uh, it will be coming uh, pretty pretty soon. Um, and then finally, on short term lets, I think probably most of you will be aware um, we have uh, went. We went to committee planning committee earlier in the month and got approval for a consultation on a short term let control area uh, planning control area for the whole of the council's uh, geographic area. So that's. Uh, the, the whole of the, the uh, city, as well as outlying areas such as uh, Queen's Ferry and um, uh, Ratho and, 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 and so on. Uh, the, the, the reason we did that uh, was because, uh, we, well, we're aware that there are concentrations of short-term lets within the uh, city centre and the, the wards immediately uh, next to it. Uh, we're also conscious that there's a very large number of short-term lets uh, all across the city, and our enforcement caseload indicates that uh, issues arise um, in all parts of uh, in all parts of the the city. Um, additionally, what we felt was that it would be challenging to define a, a precise boundary, and if we did do that, a smaller boundary, what we felt was that there is potential uh, that the problem could be moved. Uh, else, elsewhere, and I think it's fair to say that there are problems that arise uh, from short-term lets, particularly in relation to uh, amenity impacts on uh, on neighbouring households and uh, in 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 neighbourhoods. Uh, I think the final thing. Sorry, phones making funny noises here. I think the final thing was that there is an issue of uh, uh, housing a kind of wider issue of housing loss. Uh, now that in our current policy framework uh, is not something that we uh, consider. But you may be aware that from the choices document for city plan, so that was the main issues report for city plan, it was something that we were exploring through that. So again, um, that's something that we'll consider as we bring forward um, bring forward the, the city plan its, itself. Um, so we've we've the consultation period is due to start on Friday. Uh, it's actually when we reported to committee, we were saying it was going to be a six week period, but we've taken some further advice from colleagues, and the decision has been made to run it for a nine week uh, period. So that gives everyone plenty of time uh, to engage. We fully expect that we'll get a lot of feedback from uh, from the industry um, because there's obviously big players involved in the internet platforms that kind of. Um, provide the, the sort of conduit for people to be able to look at these things. Um, and then there's a lot of interest from the individual property uh, owners. But we're also very interested to hear back from uh, communities and individuals 
who are affected by short-term lets to understand what they think about um, whether we should have a, a short-term let control area in the city and uh, B, uh, whether it should be the extent to, to which we've proposed. So it's a simple consultation, really asking uh, those two questions. A couple of other things. One is, uh, it's important to say uh, this isn't a, a blanket ban on uh, short-term lets, uh, but what it does do if, if, it, if, it is, um, if it does progress is it does allow a, a greater degree of planning control because at the moment it can be quite hard to determine uh, whether there has been a, a material change of use uh, which requires planning uh, permission. And what this will do is allow um, properties that do require uh, planning permission to, to come forward. It won't be them all because the legislation uh, states that if you live in the property, um, then it's effectively exempt from the control area. So if you're letting your property out uh, because you're away on holiday for a couple of weeks, or if you're letting out rooms within your own home that you live in, uh, then again, likewise, that's that's exempt. Um, but it will will uh, look at those properties where they aren't the the owner doesn't uh, doesn't live within them. Um, so as I say, nine week uh, consultation, and then the final thing is just in terms of what happens following that. We're going to need a wee bit of time to digest uh, all of that feedback. And um, as these things go, we expect to get quite a bit of feedback. Um, once we've done that, we'll be taking it to the earliest committee. And I think we undertook with um, councillors that we will we'll, we'll aim for the February uh, planning committee, which is towards the end of uh, February in 2022. If uh, at that stage, we'll either bring forward the same um, proposal or an amended proposal. It could be amended in respect of uh, the particular reasons why we've set out that we think there should be a short-term control area, or it could be amended to shrink the area. Um, if if council councillor, sorry, the planning committee decides at that point uh, to proceed with it, we would then submit it to the Scottish government for its approval, and uh, we would have to obviously wait wait to hear back from the government before we would be allowed to, to progress with it. So that's the um, probably the um, uh, important planning consultation that's uh, going to be underway very, very eminently. Okay, thank you, David. Um, any questions or comments on that? I see David's trying to come in. But was it? Yeah, it wasn't quite clear there, yes. No, it's not on the, not on that point. I will have a question afterwards, but not on that point. Sorry about that. Well, is it, there's anything, first of all, you know, particularly on either the city plan or the uh, Airbnb? Um, it, it just just regard the city plan is, I think, David, if I'm correct, you're targeting the 29th of September planning committee meeting to get the approval for the formal consultation phase. And I think it's just while I'm here, I just wonder because of the time of that, whether members of the forum would welcome uh, and, and whether David could could kind of attend or one of his team could attend a special ad hoc um, civic forum meeting to, to, to get a presentation on the consultation draft to give members as much time as possible to consider the contents of it and, and get their comments in. Yeah, so just on that, my um, my colleagues are quite clear. Every time I use the word consultation, I get corrected. It's a period of representation. Yes. Uh, so there's a, I, I guess there's a subtle difference there. But uh, what I would say was, yeah, I, I think that's something that we, we should do. Um, I would propose that we do that um, at the start of the representation period, which might be a few weeks uh, after it goes through um, after it goes through uh, committee and we need to just wait and see what, what committee are, are saying about it. So at the moment, the development plan scheme, which is the document that sets out when our development plan uh, or how it's going to be uh, progressed, that's saying that uh, we're, we're aiming for the uh, effectively that, that committee on the on the 29th. If there's any any change to that, we'll, we'll let you know. But as I say, um, we're, we're, it's kind of um, all hands on deck at the moment to um, progress uh, the city plan uh, towards that committee. So, so you you liaise with Terry, I guess, to 
find a suitably mutually suitable date for the next one. <coughs> the, the question come in, what is the difference between a consultation and a period of representation, capital P, capital R? Um, I guess the, the probably the, the subtle difference is that when we issue the main issues report, uh, we engage on that and that is much more of a, a consultation where we're posing questions. Uh, whereas this time when we put the plan forward, we're saying effectively this is the, the settled view of the council uh, and this is this is the plan and people can make representations. So it's more like, I suppose it's a bit more akin to the representation period that you get with a planning uh, application. People can make their observations and comments on it, but at that stage we're very much saying this is this is the view of the uh, of the council in terms of the way that the, the city should develop. See Janice has her hand up yeah. and then maybe David wants to come back in. Janice. Can you just unmute yourself, Janice, please? <clears throat> You're still muted, Janice. I think maybe a little icon on the bottom left. Yep. What's the pressure, you see? Well, shall we just, just while Janice finds the unmute button, uh, maybe David would wish to come in with his question. We can't hear David. I, and I can't hear you, David, but, but you're also but not sure. Janice is on mute. I suggest we go to Janice. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Terry? Yeah, well, can we go I'll, to I'll, Janice? I'll come back to you in a second, David. But we'll right. go back to Janice. Okay, so just hold on there. <laughs> I just um, want to pick up on the city plan. The fact that we were um, advised, we've been advised all the way through that it's never been updated to take account of the economic, of economic impact of COVID and the way, how that's going to reshape things going forward. And I just wonder when that will happen? Um, what, how often is it going to be revised? Um, it's a good question. It's probably one I need to take away and um, maybe bring back to the next session when we, we have my colleagues along from the development plan uh, team. Um, the I, I guess the thing with with COVID is that the, the the economy. There are aspects of the economy that I think will um, that we in planning are going to have to think about over the over the coming years. And I think we've one of those that we've just touched on is just the outdoor hospitality issue which is maybe a, a small but probably fairly kind of prominent example in some respects so I think there'll be things that will be that, that we will be looking at and um, that there are kind of consequences either direct or maybe slightly indirect consequences of of, of COVID um, in terms of this the plan cycle um, the the I think the requirement is for us to bring forward another plan within the next five years of that one being adopted but the the, the legislation is changing. Um, uh, uh, the development planning legislation is is changing, so we just need to see what all of that that says as the government brings forward new uh, regulations and make sure that we're compliant with uh, with all of that. Yeah, it's just that some of the things that are happening now, and there's no sort of quick let up on them, is um, but stuff like people returning to work, people in offices, um, students, student accommodation, you know, a massive impact that they will have on the economy and it, obviously the hospitality sector too. So I just feel it's such, it, it's, it's just really big stuff. And I think it probably could do with um, being revamped. I know it's maybe, um, quite hard to do that on an annual basis, but I can see things are going to change quite a bit over the next five years. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the plan doesn't work as much as we would probably all like it to. Uh, yeah. It doesn't definitely doesn't work on a, an annual basis. So the last plan we prepared, uh, the local Edinburgh Local Development Plan, 
that was a number of years in the making and that that came forward and it was adopted in 2016 so we're now um we're going to be a little bit late in terms of the adoption of the next plan um but normally we're working on a kind of five-year cycle that that will change to a 10-year cycle as as we move on um sorry you'd said you'd said something else what the in relation sorry, I was just really talking about the impact of what's happening with yeah. the offices and the I, accommodation. I part of the challenge there is that in terms of the consultation, so the uh, the main issues report was obviously done prior to uh, prior to COVID. Some of the effects of COVID um, we are we can't be fully certain about because we've not you know we're going through a period of hopefully moving into a period of recovery now. Um, but the, the you can't stray too far from what what you've said in your consultation uh, through the the main issues report. So I think that's one of the reasons why we've we've been saying um, you know some of the COVID aspects can't come through. And as, I suppose the other thing is it's early in the you know some of these effects will as I say are quite obvious uh, like the outdoor hospitality, but others are going to maybe take longer to to play out uh, as people you know, taking the example of. And working from home, um, many uh, many businesses are continuing to work from uh, their office. Workers are continuing to work from home at the moment. Where we end up in the future, we we can't be certain about because it will be you know different businesses will play it out in in, in different ways. And um, I suspect in the future we'll still be uh, there will still be have large numbers of people potentially working from home, perhaps more quite a bit more than worked uh, previously that could have advantages in terms of um transport movements not so much need for people uh, coming into the uh, into the center of the town or into the big employment areas it might also have uh, benefits for uh, some of the neighborhood uh, communities out in the periphery as more people are around during the day and able to patronize the, the shops and businesses and cafes and such like uh, around these these areas which might be you know, help to sustain them. So there, there can be, I think, um, there, there will probably be impacts that are, that are potentially negative. I think there'll also be impacts that can potentially be positive as well. But I think we're going to have to, we're, we're all going to have to be looking at this, this over the next few years and just seeing how it, how it pans out. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, can you take your hand down as well, please, Janice? Thanks. Right, okay. David's been extremely patient, so your turn. That's me, is it? Can you hear me? Okay. It's slightly quiet, but yeah. Way up, okay. It's for David Given. It's um, it's slightly aside. Uh, it's, I'm in Leith. Uh, it's about the trams, of, uh, about the effect on the older buildings down here. Um, there was a... a a, a rewritten report about Cranbourne noise uh, because there was no, there had never been an initial report, and there's there is a obviously re some report about vibration uh, from the tram as when it's installed. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a problem. Um, the trams were asked a couple of months ago, would they be doing post measurement on vibration and Cranbourne noise? Uh, from the tracks, and their answer was uh, that will this will be handed over to the council for them. It will be their responsibility to be doing that. Now, my question is, uh, who, where, when they say handed to the council, who will be doing this? And because it is of importance to a, a, a great number of residents, especially down Constitution Street, where the tram is exceedingly close. To the building um, and at the moment it's not quite clear because at the meeting of the transport and environment committee on the 19th of august this month uh, the trams uh, were discussing about moving trams to new haven into lovian buses so i'm not quite sure where who's responsible who is responsible then for this obviously post tram uh, let's say uh, re uh, doing the testing. Obviously, there must be some done at that time. Uh, would it be possible to answer that, David? 
I'm going to be terrible and say the short answer is no. I can't answer that one because it's kind of out with my my remit. As so far as planning is concerned, we've we've got a very limited remit over the over the tram uh, and can only consider uh, elements such as the tram stops and the tram poles. We don't have any uh, say over what happens uh, in in the surface of the the tram or the way that that's designed. What I can do. If you want to drop me an email, uh, sort of detailing the points that you've made, I can pass that on to my colleagues who are leading on the tram and see if we can get uh, an answer uh, for you. So I don't know um, in terms of what you're talking about, in terms of monitoring vibration and noise, um, what what the council's responsibilities are for that um, and uh, and how we will uh, how we will progress uh, with that, if, if at all. And, and that's not to... Um, alarm you or, or um, kind of dismiss what you're saying. I just want to be, I just don't want to um, commit to anything that in fact that we, we might not be doing. But if we are doing that, um, we'll certainly get you the information on on how we're going to go about it. Well, David, I have, you know, that I have had many conversations with the trans because I am at the moment already affected by this bus lane you've put down here. Uh, you know, uh, I asked two months ago for them to repair a pothole. Nothing happens. Uh, basically, you know, I've, why I've brought this up with you now is because what I, you know, what we, what happens, you get answers like, oh, well, the it's the council's responsibility, you know. And when that, the trams are asked these things, this is the problem you're getting all the time. You know, there are a lot of people who are very frustrated because we never get a clear answer. It's always like, oh, we'll get back to you, and nothing ever happens. So, why I'm asking you specifically about this is, you know, what if they keep saying it's the council's responsibility, you know, who in the council is responsible and where, you know yeah. what I mean? And this so, is so I guess, sorting out, because, uh, you know, people are going to be sitting in two years' time thinking, all right, they go away, and there's going to be, you know, if there are problems with the vibration and groundborne noise, you know, you know, and there's no one to go to. And if the trams to New Haven have uh, enveloped themselves into Lovian buses, does that then become a Lovian bus? This problem. You see what I mean? This is a complicated question. And you know, I think, I, I think David, the, the thing to do is to, yeah. to capture that in a note to kind of David, and we can kind of yeah. pick that up rather than, okay. than yeah. Yeah. spend David, David, just so that I don't lose sight of your email, yeah. what's your last name? Uh, Wallacher. Yeah, Wallacher. Very well known right. in the planning department. Okay. Right, that's, <laughs> that's great. I'll... I'll have a look out for that, and um, yeah, if you 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 email me, uh, as I, I say, will do about it, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll try and get that an answer to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. I see Andrew with his hand up. Yeah, just a quick question about uh, trees. I sent a comment this morning about a, an application mm -hmm. to cut down a tree in our area, and got a the, the officer concerned. I've not got an automated response saying the officer concerned was away contact the trees email mailbox, which I did, and then got a response saying, due to staff shortages, you may not get any response from us. Can I ask, is, is, is this a temporary problem there or longer term and how serious is it? We've, we've recently taken on a, another tree officer. Um, so we've been looking at all our processes around uh, the, the management of trees in terms of um, works of trees that are protected. Um, so we think we've got the resource that we need, but there has been a bit of a, a bit of a backlog. But if you want to email me uh, the particular issue, I can get that looked into you, into uh, for you and make sure you, that you get an answer to that. Okay, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm happy to do that, but I don't want to add to your burdens. I mean, maybe I should give them you know, give it a day or two to see if there is a reply, but and then perhaps if there isn't, I'll I'll, I'll send you an email. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. If you want to send it on, if you're if you if you don't get a response, because we certainly we'd like to get back to you. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew and Peter Williamson. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, evening, David. Just a, a question about, and I'm not sure if it's exactly within your remit about Piccadilly Place. Um, and for a long time, there's supposed to have been a, a, a sort of public discussion about what happens in the central <laughs> island. Are you in a position to offer any of an update on that? Right. Yeah, again, this is one I think we'll need to go away and, and have a wee look into that. Um, and 
Uh, so I've just taken a note here, Picardy Place. Yeah, because there's obviously been a lot of work happening there recently in relation to St. James and then the, the tram works are uh, continuing, um, but there is the space within the middle. And I, and I yeah. think, as you're saying, there was some uh, commitment to have some engagement around that. So I'll, I'll have a wee look in to see what, what's happening around that. That'd be helpful. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. And Mike Birch. Yeah, David, really it's a continuation of the point that Peter just made about Piccadilly Place. Could you just outline for me the responsibilities of the planning department in terms of public realm uh, versus the transport department? Um, this, is a, this is an interesting one because certain aspects of what happens within a road are out with the scope of planning that are excluded by the... The, the planning apps act so where there's an improvement to a road and um, that can be uh, and it's been carried out by the roads authority then it can be out with the, the planning uh, uh, the scope of planning by virtue of what the, the planning act says and then in circumstances where works are getting done to the road very large elements of that can be permitted development so again uh, don't require a grant of uh, an express grant of planning uh, permission. Um, so, yeah, if, if it works to existing roads, often it will be out with the, the scope of the, the planning service in, in that regard. Yeah, I was particularly concerned about the, the public realm. So effectively everything other than the carriageway. Um, so when I suppose, yeah, just clarifying that, when I talk about a road, uh, what I would mean, what, what a road includes in terms in terms of uh, the Road Scotland Act is the carriageway, the footway that you walk on. It can include cycleways and I think the verges as well. So it, it's quite a wide uh, scope of things that, that make up a, a road. And therefore, in terms of those aspects where I was ex effectively describing what's kind of excluded from the planning system, uh, that um, obviously includes quite a wide uh, range of, of elements. Um, now we do obviously work with our, our our colleagues, and then and there can be public realm schemes that aren't part of the road. So, for example, the centre of Picardy Place might be something that is out with the with the scope of that it isn't part of the uh, it isn't part of the road. So, uh, where applications come forward, we obviously just progress those in the in the normal way, and they uh, they'll be uh, neighbour notified and publicised in the normal way, and people can uh, can comment on those. And then we obviously, when we're determining those applications, have regard to what the development plan says and uh, any other material considerations. So it's, yeah, I don't, it's, it's probably not that, I don't know if that's the answer you were, it's maybe not the answer you were looking for, but. Well, I'll, if, I'll ask one more clarification yeah, and then I'll yeah. let the, the conversation. Permitted development, who determines whether permitted development is available? Is that the transport department or is it the planning department? So the, the permitted development order is set by the government. So when we're looking at these things uh, with our colleagues in transport, we'll be looking carefully at what the wording of the, uh, the legislation says to determine whether or not planning permission is, is required. And there'll be some instances where it might be required and then some instances where it's, uh, where it's not. But it's quite a sort of, well, as these things go, I think it's quite a complex area of uh, planning legislation. So... Uh, and the, as I say, the council's got quite wide powers to implement things without getting an express grant of planning permission. So sometimes things will come forward where, where it's just not required. Chair, if I could could suggest, I, I think I know where some of these things could, could have link up and it's that maybe it's a subject, um, David, for us to have at another civic forum meeting with some of your other colleagues from other departments. I think it's from, from many members of the Civic Forum point of view is whose departments does what, where, when is not actually the issue. It is the variable quality of, of how things come. So, so there seems to be, you know, the, you know, what is considered within scope through a TRO process isn't what would be considered within scope if it was a planning application, uh, despite the fact that it's still the same street on the same, in the same neighborhood, in the same conservation area, in the same, same, same environment. So. I think that we could probably have a really good civic forum discussion about how we think about those civic spaces going forward. Um, that might be the best way of, 
I saw Mike kind of nodding his head, and I suspect that that you know, kind of David and Jennifer and others who raised similar points would probably welcome that discussion too. So we could we could maybe have a separate kind of chat to see just just what that would look like. Yeah, that sounds good. Is Jennifer wanting in? And if so, can you unmute yourself, please, Jennifer? Thanks. I was just going to ask if we could include in that things like breach of planning applications, because we put in several and we've been waiting in some cases for months for a response from the local review body or where it's gone. Um, and that's causing some concerns. So if that could be incorporated into whatever you suggested about planning. That would be helpful. So Jennifer, you've, you've touched on a couple of things there. One is a, bre a, a breach of planning application. I think we've got, if it's a breach of planning control, we, our enforcement team will will look at those. Um, we, uh, the, the, sorry, to, to, to raise those, we've got a portal or a, a web page where you can put all the information that we need yeah. to start processing those. You also touched on the local review body. That's for when uh, an application has been uh, refused and uh, it's not been determined or wouldn't have been determined by the uh, development and management subcommittee it is then if it's been refused under delegated powers then it then goes to the local review body which is a body of five of the uh, councillors uh, to determine yes i've been in touch with them and had a, a lot of sort of um communications, but it all seems to be a bit sort of distance and isolated. We've been waiting for a site visit on one of the areas that were refused planning and they've gone ahead and done things. And that was due to be done in April 2020, but, but um, was cancelled. And it's still not being done. And we we're just wondering when site visits were going to be available again. Also a breach of planning I did get a response saying that, yes, they were aware of this and they had spoken to the owner, but nothing has happened. So it's just that lack of sort of feedback or getting information to resolve because it adds an awful lot of work onto our community councils when we're already dealing with normal planning applications. Okay. Especially in Leith, where there's so much conservation area and listed buildings, it makes it very hard. Okay, so just in relation to site visits, uh, we did suspend site visits um, for uh, during the, the kind of COVID, um, or I suppose the height of the COVID emergency. So we haven't been doing many, but I did have some correspondence from colleagues asking questions about that just the other day. Uh, so I'll need to check in and just see where we're at with the, the local review body on site visits and whether they can be uh, resumed. Again, if you want to pass me the details of the enforcement case, if it's, a, if it's an enforcement case that is kind of in, I think they're describing it as being kind of in limbo. Uh, if you want to give me the details of that, I can again check in on that and see where, where we're at with it and get you an update. Thank you. Yeah. Th th thanks, David, for, for that. I'm conscious of time. Yeah, I was going to say, can we move on? If I just put one comment in. Um, you know, somebody's suggesting that site visits may have been resumed, but uh, just one thing I think on the um, Airbnb, I do think it's crucial that the zone covers the whole city, because otherwise I think it would just be like parking zones, that what happens is the, the crush comes immediately over the boundary of the zone that's covered, it was simply displaced stuff, uh, because Edinburgh is such a small city, that everywhere in it is potentially a destination. If you take out the the, the city centre, for example, you you just push the the stuff elsewhere. But anyway, that that's for another day or an, another consultation. So, are we happy then to move on? I think to Elizabeth or Beth uh, about the zero carbon. Thanks, Chair. Sorry. Now, Beth, do you need do you need to share the screen, or are you just going to? Freelance it. Um, oh, excellent. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping my colleague David can do that. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so thanks. The first thing to, to say is thank you very much for um, inviting me to come and talk to you this evening. I'll, I'll try to um, keep it brief so we've got plenty of time for discussion. Um, just to let 
people know I'm not able to see the comments bar on, on my IT setup. So if people are putting um, questions or anything into the comments bar, if we could pick it up at the end, that would be great. I'm, I'm not intentionally ignoring those questions or anything. Um, so um, just to start, some of you might be aware that the, the council is currently um, consulting on a draft 2030 climate strategy for the city. Um, that's live on our consultation hub just now. Um, the consultation closes on the 12th of September. Um, so I really do hope that, that people will take the time to go along and have a look at it um, and give us their feedback through that online survey. Um, one thing I should highlight is the strategy is quite a comprehensive document. So we've intentionally designed the consultation so that after answering three or four core questions, you've got the ability to just skip to the sections that most interest you. You don't need to work your way through a, a very lengthy um, consultation document, although we would, of course, be delighted um, if you did. Um, so next slide. Thanks, David. Um, just before I delve into the strategy, I thought it would be useful to just explain um, what we mean by some of the terms we use within the strategy. I'm, I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with these terms, but sometimes it's useful to just be really clear about how we are using them within the strategy. So we've, we've quite intentionally gone for a net zero target for the city. Um, so we're not focusing just on carbon, we're targeting all harmful greenhouse gas emissions. And with it being a net zero target, it means there's a commitment there to look at ensuring we're removing um, the same proportion of greenhouse gases that were emitted by 2030, so that we have that net zero. Um, also, the, the strategy is very much about reducing the city's emissions, but it's also about adapting to the climate change that we know is coming. Um, we often talk about that in terms of, of uh, developing climate resilience within the strategy. Um, we know that um, the harmful greenhouse gases that have been emitted in previous years um, will hang around in the environment for, for decades to come, even if we were to stop emitting tomorrow. Um, so we know there is climate change that is coming down the line that's unavoidable. So we know we want to adapt the city uh, to be resilient to that. Next slide, thanks, David. Um, I mentioned that this is a strategy for the city. The council is leading on its development and leading on the consultation, but um, it's very much about working with all the major city partners. I think the council's emissions amount to about 3% of the, the city's overall footprint. So 97% of those emissions require us to work in partnership with others um, if we're going to, to tackle them. So the strategy is primarily aimed at those larger city partners who perhaps also share a duty to transition to net zero or who have a significant city footprint um, and most importantly the power and the budgets to, to make change. Um, that said, the strategy also looks to speak directly to citizens, communities and also the wider big, uh, business community. Um, knowing that small changes made by large numbers of, of people collectively will, will add up to have huge impact as well. Um, next slide, thanks, David. Um, so I've done a bit around um, the climate change that we know is coming, but the approach we've taken with the strategy is very much to try and focus on the positives around taking action uh, to tackle climate change. Um, so the, the slide in front of you just now is just trying to set out some of the benefits that we would hope to be able to secure for the city and by the way that we go around, we go about trying to trying to achieve that net zero city by 2030. Some of the other plans and strategies that will help deliver this one are, are listed over in, in the right hand side. Um, again, we know that it's going to require a huge effort by a wide range of partners and plans such as um, City Plan 2030 that David's um, just been speaking about will also be key to, to delivering that vision. Um, next slide, thanks, David. We've also worked with partners in Edinburgh and Leeds universities to look at the economic case um, for net zero. So we've modelled the investment that would be required um, to deliver interventions which um, will help reduce the city's emissions. I can say more about that later if, if people would find it useful. Um, but in summary terms, 
we've modelled interventions that would um, deliver net returns over their lifetime, those that would pay for themselves and those that will pay for themselves but over a slightly um, longer time scale. Next slide, thanks, David. So just in terms of what the strategy focuses on, um, I've been asked to, to keep it to about 15 minutes this evening. So um, I will say a little bit more about the Net Zero Climate Resilient Development and Growth Team. Um, and I do have uh, further detail for each of those other areas as well, if, if people would find it interest, uh, would, would be interested, but I'll, I'll stop short um, in the time we've got. These reflect the main chapters within the strategy. Um, so in terms of empowering and engaging citizens, I mentioned that we know um, if we're going to achieve net zero by 2030, we need to be taking people with us. We need to be engaging citizens on the need for change. We need to be informing people about um, the different choices, small choices that they could make in, in their lives, but also um, about the power they've got um, to engage uh, with their communities and encourage that wider action. In terms of net zero climate resilient development and growth, um, we know that the city of Edinburgh is, is set to grow in, in population terms, and we know that that brings with it a requirement for things like um, increased housing and the associated infrastructure that comes with it. So the strategy is very much focusing on how we can ensure that the city is able to grow in a sustainable way, um, and in one which is in a way which ensures that we're also designing in that climate resilience that I mentioned. Um, the strategy also has a big focus on net zero heat and energy generation um, and also on energy efficient buildings. Um, we know that around 70% of the city's emissions footprint is associated with, with energy, with how we, we heat and power um, the city's buildings. We also know that the cleanest um, and greenest energy is the energy that doesn't get used in the first place. So the strategy has a big focus on energy efficiency in buildings to, to reduce, help reduce that energy demand. Um, net zero transport, um, I'm sure many, many of those of you on the call will be familiar with um, the city mobility plan. And um, within the strategy, we're really focusing in on uh, those areas of, of mobility that can help support um, reducing those emissions. Um, business and skills in a net zero economy, the strategy also has a focus in that area. Um, we know that we face challenges in relation to supporting the city's um, current sectors to transition to more sustainable business practices. So it looks at how we can support small and larger businesses um, to do that. Um, we also know that we need to be developing a workforce which is going to be able to um, support some of the changes that, that I just mentioned um, on the previous slide. Finally, investing in change. I mentioned we'd worked with um, Edinburgh and Leeds universities to, to model the economic case. It, it is just modelling. We, it's never perfect. We do need to keep revisiting it. Um, but the, the economic case has, has been set out. And um, there therefore is a challenge around connecting the investment that's required um, into the city in order to um, deliver uh, those interventions and, and the new technologies that I mentioned previously. So just next slide. I'll go quite quickly through these. The, the strategy contains, I think it's around about 52 different actions, um, which please, please do take a look at those um, when you've got time. Just in, in summary, um, they focus on recognising um, that change um, happens within an environment and a context, um, and that we have many levers available to us to try and create that environment that, that really helps to create the conditions for success. Um, so ensuring that people um, have the supports they need um, to be able to, to act differently, but also some of those um, planning and regulatory and policy infrastructure um, is also helping to deliver that uh, deliver that context. Um, I spoke about um, the need for us to collaborate and work with wider city partners. No, no single partner acting alone is going to be able to achieve the, the ambition of a net zero Edinburgh by 2030. So some of the partnerships that we would look to form um, are mentioned on that slide. Um, next slide, thanks, David. Um, I mentioned the importance of engaging and empowering communities. 
Um, we're looking to pilot some new approaches um, to that, particularly in the space of energy generation. And we're obviously wanting to connect that to our 20 minute neighbourhood um, approach. Um, I spoke about working with city partners um, to encourage change. We've been working with the Edinburgh Independent Climate Commission and they've developed a city climate compact, um, which I'm really pleased to see many city partners have signed up to. Um, it includes a commitment to doing everything that they can to reduce their, their organisational emissions. I can say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, I spoke about um, citizen engagement and awareness raising, so we're, we'll be looking to, to do um, what's in that space. Um, and I spoke about support to small businesses, so we're keen to explore establishment of um, new uh, finance schemes where we can. So next slide, thanks, David. Um, I mentioned about innovation, and um, these are just some examples of projects that are either already underway or planned um, for the, the fairly near future. We would be looking to revisit these as we go. It's a 10 year strategy and we would be, hope, be hoping to bring forward um, developments and innovations as we go. Um, next slide, thanks David. I mentioned that no single partner acting alone will be able to achieve this. Um, also, no group of partners at, at the Edinburgh level will have all the powers and levers that they need in order to be able to affect that change, particularly at the pace and scale that we know it needs to happen. And um, so the strategy calls on Scot Scottish and UK governments um, to help unlock um, change where those levers are held at that national level. Um, next slide, thanks, David. Um, I spoke about the climate compact um, and looking for businesses and organisations to sign up to it. That's just a summary of, of what those commitments would involve. I can say um, more about that later if that would be useful. Um, next slide, thanks David. The council has, has signed up um, to that compact and this just gives you a sense of the fact that we have, uh, we're developing an emissions reduction plan, and that's about reducing that 3% um, that we contribute to the city's emissions that I just mentioned a moment ago. Next slide, thanks, David. I won't spend too long on this because there's a lot on this slide, um, but we're looking to try and understand um, the emissions that are associated um, with a range of different projects. Um, we're piloting approaches in this place. Uh, in this space, sorry, and also trying to understand some of those benefits that I mentioned before, whether that's increased green spaces or, or so forth. Um, this, this is just a, 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 an illustrative example. Um, next slide, thanks, David. I mentioned that I had some of the chapter detail for, for each of those themes. Um, I'll maybe just talk through the net zero climate resilient development growth chapter. If people would like to delve into any of the, the other themes, we, we can do so, although I'm mindful um, of your time. So in terms of the, the focus within this area of the strategy, um, we're very much uh, focusing on the outcomes we want to see delivered for our citizens um, and communities. Um, we want to ensure that we're delivering and helping to, to develop thriving local neighbourhoods, um, which reduce the need to, to travel um, in terms of the way that they're designed. Um, we want to ensure that investment and development within the city is delivering economic and environmental benefits um, for our citizens. And as the city grows, we want to ensure that it does so in a way that protects and enhances our, our green spaces and biodiversity. In terms of, of next steps, and um, the strategy is focused on setting high standards with the levers that we've got available to us, whether that's um, powers um, or whether that's things like council led developments and um, where we can approach them in a, a particular um, more sustainable way. We're also calling for more powers and levers where, where we don't have them available to us. I mentioned um, on the previous slide um, work we hope to do with Scottish and UK government in that space. Um, we're also um, focusing on designing in that climate resilience um, that I mentioned earlier um, in the presentations. 
um, using nature-based solutions where, where we can. So thinking about um, how can we think innovatively about things like um, managing flood risk and so forth, so that it's delivering biodiversity benefits at the same time, um, and also health and wellbeing benefits um, for, for citizens. Oh, next slide, thanks, David. Um, this is just uh, some of the reports or other work that I mentioned. So there's a link to the consultation there. Um, there's a link to more information around what the council is doing in relation to sustainability. Um, also, I mentioned Edinburgh's Independent Climate Commission um, and the Climate Compact that they've developed. There's, there's a link there for that. Um, also, um, the Climate Commission produced a piece of work called um, Forward Faster Together. Um, which was about how we could look to support a green recovery from COVID. So I know from conversation earlier, some, some members may be interested to have a look at that report. Also, just in terms of, of transparency and us trying to understand our own carbon footprint better, um, the Council is part of the Carbon Disclosure Project um, and reports emissions that way. And you may be aware we also have duties under the public bodies climate um, change legislation so so we report that way um to I'll pause there I've I've um sorry one more slide thanks David just in terms of next steps I mentioned um the consultation during the summer we've undertaken um a range of of engagement workshops um, and also we're working with partners to collaborate on implementation plans that will sit underneath the, the strategy. Um, we're planning to take the final strategy plus a draft implementation plan back to Council in October and we're quite intentionally looking to publish the strategy just ahead of COP26 coming to Scotland and um, I think we're seeing an opportunity there to raise awareness um, of both the strategy and the issues that it's trying to tackle and um, when the eyes of the world will, will be on Scotland um, in terms of that major global conference. Um, next slide, thanks, David. And the final one, and I, I know people may have questions on some of the content, that I just went through there is, there is a lot it is a very it is a very long um, strategy document and um, here's some things we were keen to talk to forum members about but I'm more than happy to, to hand back and ask any particular points of clarification you might have thanks okay thanks very much Beth um, before opening it more generally I, I invite uh, James from the Coburn to um, briefly outline the sort of responses that the Coburn has been coming up to in this consultation. Oh, we also I managed to unmute myself, sharing, so yeah. all, all was an achievement. Um, well, I, I suppose the, the first comment um, we might want to make is, that, of course, um, the, the current um, net zero strategy is, is, is not the Council's first step in terms of tackling carbon emissions from the city in terms of um, adapting the city to a changing local climate. It's uh, part of an ongoing discussion, an ongoing set of um, strategies, actions and plans that probably date back 10, 15 years uh, in, in one form or another. Uh, and as it has just been outlined, the, the current initiative does build upon a number of other um, in, initiatives which, which are, are, are aiming on the face of it at uh, promoting active travel or um, um, promoting energy efficiencies, but it's, it's all linked together into one narrative that's, that, that's about making uh, uh, the city l less carbon intensive and better adapted to a changing, uh, a changing um, a, a local climate. Um, I think it's also important to stress, of course, that um, the current strategy, the current consultation, again, itself is, is, is part of an ongoing conversation about climate in the city that the council and its partners, including the Col uh, Coburn and other um, civic bodies, have been involved, uh, involved in um, over a long period of time. Again, years, uh, increasingly, the conversations have be become more and more intense, of course, as climate change has moved up the agenda. So the, the, the current strategy document, the, the, the uh, Net Zero Initiative, uh, the push towards adapting the city is all, in some, in some respects, it's an, an expression, I have to say, 
of, of what many people, many community bodies, many city organizations have been saying for a long time. Um, as an organization ourselves, uh, the Coburn will, will, will look forward to the detail of the implementation of some of the initiatives that are, that are in, in the current strategy. Um, delivering and delivering at pace uh, is very important because um, Edinburgh's target is, is set earlier than the Scottish target for net zero emissions. And so in terms of the city's performance, we have to make sure that the outline actions in the strategy that, that we have in front of us do actually get implemented and they get implement, implemented uh, very quickly. Um, that, that's one of the most important things. And of course, uh, whilst I've just said that many organisations have been involved in conversations about climate change and, and, and developing climate strategy and actions, it's also important that we think to, to continue to engage local communities and to engage citizens and communities in local neighbourhoods, as partly has been outlined, in, in, in a very practical way in terms of the the, the practical benefits that being a, a well-adapted low-carbon city can, can, can deliver for all citizens. There's certainly clearly challenges ahead. Um, the, the short time scale is a challenge. Getting cash to deliver some of these projects will also be a, um, a challenge because after all, Edinburgh isn't an island. It's part of a, the, the wider Scottish economy, um, part of the wider UK economy. And there, and there are many different cities and many different partners um, uh, across the city, which, across the country, uh, which have got their own projects and their own priorities and are perhaps also looking uh, at the same funding packages or similar funding packages. So uh, all, all in all, it's the, the current strategy is, is not an end in itself, but it is part, I think, of Edinburgh's continuing um, journey along the road to, to, to a zero carbon city and a well-adapted city. Um, there are plenty of challenges ahead, but um, del and delivering meaningful projects at scale and at speed, at speed is certainly going to be one of the, the bigger challenges for the council and its partners. Its partners, of, of course, in, including everyone here, every community in the city and every citizen in the city. Okay, thank you. So any, anybody else wish to contribute on this? Doreen? Um, yes, I, I'm from uh, the Portobello Amenity Society, and we'll be responding to the document that we haven't finalised our submission yet. But I have a, a serious concern that in the discussion about the document, the focus is on the detail of what's being proposed for parking and traffic control in Portobello in a very negative way. And I would like to see some way of bringing the debate back to the higher level where I think there would be a lot more support um, of how to attain our, our goals for gar carbon emission. And um, it's not just about people's right to um, own one or two cars and park them outside their door, um, but some of that will have to be cut through and there will have to be radical strategies for shifting people out of cars onto public transport. Um, I'm not hearing that in the presentation, um, but uh, I, I wonder if you could comment on that problem of how to move from the, the local personal interest concerns to the bigger picture and how to get to where we all, I assume, want, want to be in the end. Thanks. Um... Do you want me to, to just respond on that just now? Yeah, I can show you. Thanks. Thanks, Doreen. Um, and so partly, partly just in terms of being sensitive to time, or um, not having um, the uh, sorry time available that I usually would. So in terms of... Um, thinking about that bigger picture in relation to, to transport and um, I started to talk a little bit about recognizing that people you know act within an environment and a context and that environment can either support and enable more sustainable choices or, or it can act as a barrier so in terms of that big shift around transport 
um, I think what the strategy looks to do is um, design a city transport system, um, which makes it easier. So that's about improving public transport. Um, it's about improving active travel um, routes. By that, I mean walking, cycling, or indeed using a wheelchair. Um, and it's also about raising awareness of the bigger picture. So the strategy has some proposals in it around um, public awareness campaigns, but also around working with um, community groups um, and across a whole range of different different groups who are who are closer um, to people's everyday um, everyday lives. And then there's also the economic piece there as well. Um, so I think the strategy needs to look at not only making it easier um, to use more sustainable forms of transport, but also making it, it cheaper. Um, there is a fair amount of detail in, in the document. Um, if you have a look, it's using the sustainable um, transport hierarchy model, um, which is basically looking um, at working, at ranking um, transport options in terms of their carbon impact and then working the way from the bottom to the from sorry from the top to the bottom, so making the most sustainable um, ones the cheapest and the easiest, and the rest um, the opposite down at the bottom. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? I, I, just, I see I just Andrew wanted... wanting to come in. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank Peter. You. My concern about my main concern about this document is it seems to me the strategy it seems to be much more of a wish list than a strategy. It lacks specifics, and I think one of the, the perhaps the main reason for that is that Edinburgh Council simply doesn't have the power to achieve most of these goals, and I'm concerned that the, the, the city, the council, is going to be given tasked with a responsibility. We often talk about power without responsibility, but there's also responsibility without power. And without the power to achieve net zero by 2030, uh, then it's, as I say, it's just a wish list. It's, it, and, it, and it's inevitably rather vague and well-meaning, but terribly lacking specifics. I mean, I, I attended a briefing last week online and I asked a question about the carbon equivalent impact of all the expected new housing in Edinburgh between now and 2030, how much will it be? And the answer, perfectly reasonable answer, and I'm sure, was it depends. But if you're actually serious about being carbon neutral by 2030, you can't say it depends. You've got to say we're going to stop building houses that are not, and stop any developments that are not carbon neutral. Uh, and we're going to do it by a specific date, and that date has to be quite soon. Now that may be unrealistic, and it may be beyond the council powers. That's the sort of thing we need to know. And just one very, it may seem quite a small but specific example of sort of issue. Um, I, I noticed a cruise ship coming into New Haven yesterday. And obviously, cruise ships stopped coming to Edinburgh during during the COVID pandemic. Why on earth are we allowing cruise ships, which are highly, highly have a very heavy carbon footprint. Why are we allowing cruise ships to come to Edinburgh? Maybe we don't have the power to stop them, but is that kind of thing, which nettle, which the council is going to have to grasp if this target is going to be anything like achievable by 2030? Right, yeah, go straight on to Peter. Cliff, before we go on to kind of Peter, if I can just um, add a little bit to, to um, what Arthur was saying is, when we were discussing kind of our approach to the strategy, the one um, kind of example that we noted, which seemed to do an awful lot of the things <clears throat> that Arthur articulated was Seattle's um, you know, climate strategy, which I don't know if the city has actually seen, um, where the emphasis of the city strategies, the Seattle strategy, was was less to do about the higher kind of levels, although Dorian <laughs> talked about it, but, but, but it was about establishing the very practical preparedness um, actions that it could take in place, um, taken into a focus of three main objectives, one about equity, one about benefits for all, and the other about an ecosystem kind of, kind of approach. So perhaps you know, in taking kind of Arthur's observations, the Seattle, um, plan maybe give some of the kind of answers that could actually help address those. Sorry. Okay, I'll take, I'll take Peter and then um, put them back to Elizabeth to reflect on the three contributions. Thank, thanks, Cliff. Uh, there's a statement um, 
in, in the document which says most citizens will find they no longer need a car to be able to go about their everyday lives. Is there any evidence that that will happen, even if public transport, the transport hierarchy, as you call it, is, improves? Seems to me um, that's a potential hostage to fortune. Because it's what, what that the strategy implies to me is that people, apart from using public transport and Chanks's pony and so on, will will participate in car clubs. Okay, and that will, that will be up to individuals. Can, can I can I depart from what I said earlier and let the panel put it? Because I think Michelle had a, a hand up as well. Uh, yes, I, I I would like to kind of emphasize the importance of the natural develop um, environment in uh, in in increasing open spaces, for instance, and the importance of biodiversity, closeness to a green space, um, to to help carbon management and biodiversity and health and well-being, and I just not too sure how this is going to be uh, to be achieved in in the plan but i think these are kind of important point to be made as well there thanks okay back back to elizabeth i think okay um so a lot, a lot in there I'll, I'll maybe um kind of start a little bit back was just in terms of that point um about car ownership um I think we're, we're very clear it's about people no longer needing to, to own a car. Um, we do recognise that some people will still need a car to, to move around, especially those who mobility challenges. Um, but you're right to focus in on, on the importance of car clubs within that context. Um, I think also the part of the strategy that you're, you're referring um, to is the part where we set out that vision. And I think we we do need the strategy to, to be visionary um, and it does it does try to do that. I think we do also need it to be specific and to show how some of that vision is going to be delivered. So um, just to pick up on, I think it was Andrew's um, comment about specifics. I think I mentioned we're currently working on um, an implementation plan, which will sit underneath that, that visionary strategy. Um, that implementation plan will include delivery timescales and milestones. Um, it will include details of the partners that will help to deliver the actions, but also who the lead partner will be. And again, Andrew, I think that maybe picks up on, on your point of concern around, is this all going to be left for the council to deliver and does the council have the powers and resources that it needs um, to do that? Um, the answer to that is, uh, no, the, the, the council wouldn't be able to deliver that whole vision um, acting alone. So that's why we've taken that partnership approach and, and the implementation plan, as I said, will, will detail um, actions that will be led by other partners. Um, then just, and I, I think also um, just in terms of Seattle's approach um, of focusing around those more concrete deliverables as we're developing our implementation plan, that's, that's part of what we're trying to do um, is be much, much clearer about what, when, who. Um, just finally, the, the point on um, biodiversity there. Um, the importance of uh, biodiversity and enhancing green spaces in order to protect biodiversity is it's kind of threaded right through different bits of the strategies just now. Um, I think we, we thought um, that that's important within the context of the development and growth um, piece that we were talking about, but it's also relevant when you're thinking about energy efficient buildings, you know, whether you want to be thinking about um, green roofs or, or, or green walls. Um, it's also relevant when we're thinking um, about things like um, people's gardens and, and what, what they look like. So we've tried to, to weave it all the way through the draft strategy. One of the things I want to have a think about can bring that more to the fore. Um, so that it's 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 maybe a wee bit more clearly um, visible. Um, just finally, um, picking up again on on Andrew's point around um, development, um, around requiring 
developments to be net zero and whether the council has all the powers um, and the levers that it, it needs in order to be able to do that. I think I'll defer a little bit to my colleague David here, but um, the way the city plan is being approached um, is really to look at how, how can we maximise the, the use of the levers that we do have um, and then I outlined where we don't feel we have the levers that we need. We would want to engage in a, a discussion with Scottish Government and others about how we might try to tackle that together. Yeah, just in, in uh, yeah, my mic is on. Uh, just in relation to that, yeah, the, the obviously with the city plan choices uh, document, this was something that we were we were looking at. So yeah, in terms of what comes forward with city plan. Uh, it will be exploring that issue of sustainability uh, and uh, carbon use through uh, policies uh, within it. At the moment, there's definitely a gap between, I think, where the council wants to be. We, we've we set out a um, net zero carbon uh, for 2030, uh, whereas the government currently is working uh, on a different timescale, working towards 2045, which means that uh, nationally, uh, national um, uh, uh, legislation and policies around it uh, in terms of building standards is working on that 2045 timescale. But what we want to do is try and push uh, uh, the, the the agenda on uh, using the, the tools that we have uh, within the planning system uh, to try and get uh, developments that are uh, more energy efficient uh, as, as they come forward. But we're going to have to uh, go through a bit of a process there in terms of getting the plan, uh, the proposed plan uh, approved by committee. And then obviously it needs to go through its examination period uh, with government where whatever policies we are proposing, they will be tested and closely examined by uh, the DPA, which is a, a wing of government um, through that through that process uh, before the plan is, is finally adopted. So there's a, there's a few steps along the way I'm just going to read out a few um, of the comments, that, the chats that come in, because I'm not sure that Elizabeth can see them. So Andrew said, what percentage of vehicles are expected to be electric by 2030? If there isn't a realistic target, that's a lacuna in the strategy. Then um, Richard Price says, the current commitment to electrical vehicle charging being advanced by the City Council is well beyond that being pursued by many other local authorities. Surely that's part of the answer to net zero. And um, Pam Barnes says the problem is energy efficient buildings and the need for ventilation to deal with COVID, which are to deal with COVID type situations in future. So, so energy and energy efficiency in buildings linked to ventilation. And Peter Williamson saying, good point, Richard. I think approach on car use ownership lacks an evidence base. Most people I meet expect to drive an electric vehicle they own. And Pam comes back, how to deal with the problem that we're told people are safer in their own cars. But whoops, it's just slid down because I think somebody else came in. Uh, people, people are safer in their own cars for virus problems like COVID with the need to get people onto public transport for the climate problems. So tension between COVID and climate, which way to jump? Um, Richard said behind, not beyond. And James has provided a, a link to um, an evaluation document prepared for Transition Scotland. And I think that's the end of the list. So I don't know if you want to just pick up any of those points, Elizabeth, or indeed if David wishes to comment as well. Um, okay, look, there, I'll maybe try to respond just in terms of EV infrastructure um, and car ownership. Um, I think you'll see both from the strategy and from the city mobility plan um, that as the council is thinking about EV charging infrastructure, we're also thinking about um, how we want to be moving people and, and goods around the city. Um, and where, what that then therefore tells you about where you would want to locate EV, um, EV charging infrastructure. Um, so at the moment, you'll see within the strategy, there's a proposal uh, to scope some the private sector to look at hub models. Um, so that idea about connecting the charging um, infrastructure capacity 
um, to areas where you're encouraging people to um, leave their car and uh, move on to public transport for coming into the centre of the city and recognising that a lot of the cars moving around Edinburgh are associated with in, within commuting. Um, so um, in terms of the point around um, ownership, that's one of the, the areas that we know we need to continue that ongoing discussion um, and engagement with citizens and also, also with businesses as well in terms of how they move um, goods and staff around the city um, to try and look at that move away from that need to own a, a private vehicle, which which sometimes you know, may not be in use for, for much of, of the day or the week. Um, within that context, we're recognising the importance of thinking about things like car clubs and recognising that pe for some people they still will want to use a, a car, um, hopefully an electric um, one. Um, but we also have to think about that car ownership within the context of things like planning around congestion within the city. Um, so just in terms of the connected point as well that was made um, around concerns about public transport within what is just now the, the, the COVID area, area, era, um, we recognise that that is a big issue. I think also during COVID we saw an uptick in people walking um, cycling and wheeling and um, so I think we need to focus on those positives at the same time as we look to address some of the the downside or the, the concerns around public transport and that's something that we'll need to keep um, a watch and brief on um, as as things develop and as we hopefully move move further and further out of the pandemic and um, just the Final point, I think, was around energy efficiency um, within buildings and ventilation. Um, I think I think it may just be to do with um, our, our climate when we talk about energy efficiency in buildings. I always think about heating, um, but actually, of course, cooling is is also an issue. Um, some of the the work within the, the strategy talks about different um, standards. Um, that you would use for different types of buildings. So, for example, passive house standard is, is one that's looked at for schools. Um, Innerfit is, is another standard that's looked at for um, other operational buildings. Um, so ventilation is, is an aspect of, of those standards um, as well. I would have to defer to other colleagues for more, more detail on those standards. Um, I'm, I'm a policy person, but I would be happy to, to source that if that would be useful for, for folk. Okay, I, thanks, Beth. I've got um, hands up from Terry and from Joanna. And I think at that point, I'm going to wrap up this stage of the discussion so, so we can still get through the rest of the agenda. So Terry first and then um, Joanna. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I think that the conversation was taking me kind of neatly into to where I wanted to kind of ask and Dave may come in is, is a lot of the strategy focuses around operational carbon management and not about embedded or structural kind of carbon um kind of as a, as an issue so i highlight that as something which needs to be be kind of perhaps to address um, we don't appreciate that the uk's construction sector consumes 25 percent of all energy and contributes 50 percent of all waste um but we're generally quite silent when it when we think about that embedded carbon kind of issue um that goes forward um so i guess my you know in a sense of of, of suggesting you know how we we consider that with the strategy uh, my naughty question, maybe for David, is to say, as part of this, when are you when are you planning to ban the use of concrete um, in kind of Edinburgh's environment? Um, and related to that slightly naughty question is just a little marker to note that much of the city's infrastructure um, has already paid back its carbon deficit many times over, um, and perhaps the strategy needs to kind of recognise that carbon saving that has been been undertaken kind of already before we go too far down um, a really distinct retrofit approach, which the strategy talks a lot about. And it doesn't talk about the kind of savings of how that embedded carbon um, had been managed through a conservation strategy and a maintenance strategy, um, which the strategy is silent in. Um, so there's some interesting contrasts and conundrums that are presented. Okay, I'd go to John and then I'll read out the other comments and then go back to uh, David and then give Beth the last word. 
for joining. Hi, thank you for letting me speak when I don't normally come to these meetings. In a way, I'm trying to speak for Transition Edinburgh, and David Somerville gave me the link and said I should really come because he's away on holiday. Um, as Beth knows all too well, we've been talking about this strategy for some time. I have been thoroughly involved with it and I think there's a lot of very good things there. Lots of things that definitely ought to be happening. Perhaps the speed is not as fast as would be wonderful. It'll be great when we get an implementation plan. What I want to share with people is something that surprised me. I was talking with some local people up here in Thermal Head who said, why aren't we hearing more about this strategy? We're hearing stuff from you from transition, but we've not heard anything from our community council. There's nothing in the way of notices in any of the local shops. The council may feel it is trying to engage with citizens, but there does seem to be a number of people around here anyway who have yet to hear much about the strategy. And that is really a bit sad when the consultation ends in 12 days. Okay, thanks for that point, Joanna. i just read out the, the, the comments and then I said hand it back. So uh, Richard Price is adding a point, I think similar to Terry's, uh, the current push to demolish existing buildings um, combined with their embodied carbon uh, contrasts with the aim to achieve new net, car, net zero buildings. Janice asks, what about the certainty availability of power supply, I guess, particularly perhaps in relation to EVs? Uh, Richard says, is the currently available public transport zero emissions? So is the currently available public transport at zero emissions? Is City Council in danger of trying to amalgamate the net zero strategy with other aspirations? Uh, Janice says, um, yeah, I mean, will there be an adequate supply of power? Um, James provides another useful link, uh, local authority checklist. And I think that's the end of the, the list. So, so David and then Beth, and then we move on. Yeah, I think in relation to the point around demolition, I think that's an emerging, actually an emerging discussion. And I think the RIBA just a, a couple of weeks ago were raising this as a, a as a sort of key key point to to look at the retention of buildings first uh, before we we proceed to um, uh, de demolish them. Because, and I think that the the point that they're recognising is is that one about embodied energy. There can be a huge amount of embodied energy. In a building that if it's uh and then there's obviously a lot of energy as we've just heard uh, in new construction so being able to reuse um existing buildings and improve those um is uh is, is a way of 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 you know achieving a bit better better uh outcomes in, in relation to that um as in relation to the point about concrete um i think is is we try and kind of push things in terms of what planning can do and try and push that envelope. And I think that's probably a theme that we'll, uh, we'll be looking at over the, the years, particularly through the, the policy prism with um, city plan. Uh, that may be an aspect that, that, that emerges, but of course in planning, we don't really have control. Sorry, my dog is going uh, a bit crazy here. Um, so you can bear with me. Um, yeah, we don't we don't necessarily have control in planning over how buildings are are constructed. Um, so the, the vast majority of concrete, I would imagine, in buildings is being used in their uh, in their structures and the floor slabs and so on. Uh, and then small elements uh, do get used from time to time uh, comparatively in in cladding, which is something that um, we we do have a. Um, an, an ambit uh, over so I think again yeah that, that is something that we'll be looking at increasingly what what the nature of materials are and how they are uh, how sustainable they are um in in terms of uh, other things that were kind of picked up on I think in terms of the 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 power supply that as we move towards, um, different types of heating systems within buildings. There may be more reliance on 
uh, electricity as we move towards the charging of electric cars. There's going to be more electricity required. So there might be implications in terms of planning around the infrastructure that's required for that. Do we need more substations uh, and the like? Is the is the, the grid set up to, to do that? So there's some pretty big questions there that we'll be looking at, uh, no doubt, uh, in the in the years the years ahead. I don't know whether, in terms of the other questions, whether, Beth, you would want to, or the other points, Beth would want to come in on. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. Maybe just to add around that, that point about energy supply, I think within the, the strategy, it has actions to work in partnership with Scottish Power Energy Networks to look to align that future investment in the grid to where we know the increased demand is going to come in, in terms of development. So um, just to just to highlight that. Um, I think some of the other questions were around, quite, quite rightly around some of the, the challenges we're facing. Um, I think there was a question about whether public transport is currently um, zero emission. Um, and the, the quick answer there is 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 no. Um, however, um, you know the city's investing in, in things like um, trams. Um, it's also looking to work um, with pilots for um, electric buses. There, there are challenges there in terms of um, the amount of power that's currently needed to, to make that viable. Um, we're also looking to be learning from pilots around other um, sources such as hydrogen and so forth. Um, so it's very much a case of investing heavily in, in the solutions that we know have the best performance um, and looking to continually test and pilot um, those solutions that are, are a wee bit further um, down the line um, in terms of when we would see them coming on stream. Um, I think I think it was Johanna maybe so asked, you know, why why are we not hearing um, about the strategy? I think. I could provide um, I could provide information um, by email if that would be helpful. But just in terms of the program of engagement that we've undertaken um, over the period of even developing the draft, so before we even opened the consultation, we've, we've undertaken significant um, engagement and consultation. We launched um, Edinburgh Talks Climate, which is an ongoing um, on, online dialogue with citizens. We've engaged over two thousand people that way. Um, we have um, carrying out social media campaigns, doing pieces in, in the media, promoting the link to the, links to the strategy, recognising that not everybody is, is on social media all the time. Um, we've put in place an extensive programme of these types of sessions. We would have liked these to be face to face. We, we had planned for flyers and libraries, events and community centres, but They've, they've been closed or only partially open um, during the period that we've been looking to engage. Um, that said, you know, we've been getting along and talking to um, community councils, to um, voluntary organisations. I think we've maybe done about three or four round tables with, with Transition Edinburgh. Um, so I can I can provide more detail. Um, we're, we're always grateful for anything that people we talk to can do to help cascade that information to, to help us um, to reach more people. So that would be great. Thanks. OK, well, thanks to both. And clearly there's opportunity for the members of community councils to uh, alert um, their, their own members and, and, and neighbourhood uh, about the consultation, which, as you say, is due to finish in about 12 days time. So, so thanks uh, for, for taking all that, Beth. Uh, it's, it's very good of you. So can we move to the next item, which is um, looking ahead to the people who will actually be in charge of implementing this kind of strategy, the councillors that we elect next May to be the new City of Edinburgh Council at a political level. And I think um, we've got an item on the agenda here where the Coburn has put out the, I think it was five ash that we had for the parliament elections, but I'm not quite sure, is it is it Terry that's going to talk to this or DJ or James? I think it possibly kind of, kind of falls to me. It, it could be as short or as long as anybody anybody wants it. As I did circulate- I'll probably be very, short in that case, Terry. Excellent. Uh, but I did circulate the kind of five ash that we, we did put out as part of the parliamentary elections, which form, part of our um, 
lobbying campaign or kind of agenda um kind of as we as we go forward and and um, I won't kind of recap what those are, but the um the kind of, the view of the Copen Council is that we should be looking at trying to kind of influence the kind of agenda ahead of the next local local elections as 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 Cliff has said. So um it's really looking towards kind of all of you and what you think um needs to be done or those big issues in your neighborhoods that um could feed kind of into this process or indeed whether you would be kind of willing to kind of support this as we as we go along. Um, I think our target is probably by the end of uh, of October to prepare a series of kind of asks to feed that into the various party apparatus for, for discussion. Um, but an awful lot of those do relate to the subject that we just you know, had, had talked about now, how we can begin to kind of influence change to a more sustainable Edinburgh going into the kind of future. So um, I, I'll just kind of leave it at that as, as kind of an introduction or, or, a, or a signpost. Um, if anybody wants to contribute or, or have any suggestions now, that would be great. Um, alternatively, you can always just get in contact with me in due course um, and we'll cover it off. And what we would do anyway is circulate whatever we do prepare to you um, you know, kind of ahead of publication just for your your kind of interest inputs and perhaps endorsement. Okay, thanks, Terry. Yeah, we, we understand that the political parties begin to get their own manifestos together uh, around the autumn, uh, although the election, I say, isn't until May, but there is a lead time in this, so that's why we thought we should move sooner rather than later. So I don't know if anybody's got any comments at this stage, but we can certainly bring hopefully the um, the ASH or manifesto or whatever form it takes, perhaps to the December meeting of, of this uh, forum. But if anybody's got any particular inputs at this stage, uh, we, can, we can take them. Silence, excellent. Yeah, I've not seen anything. So, so yeah, the reminder that if you've got views that you, you think should be reflected, should I add, of course, that as a charity, we're a non-political organization. So we will not be favoring any one party or, uh, or over any of the others in the election. And if you are providing uh, comments, I'd ask you to respect that and to reflect that in the, the, the kind of comments that you put in. So um, we come to members' news and views, I think, the next section. And uh, I've not been alerted to anybody who wants to make a contribution, but now is the opportunity to do so. Again, it seems quiet. I, I right? just wonder, I think, is, is Mike has perhaps could, could have left us because um, he could have discussed the issue around the containerization of waste, which has been kind of ruled out across the kind of tenemental areas. But since he's he's gone, I'll just let that one pass. Yes, anybody else has concern on that one? Okay, I don't see it. So in that case, can we go to the next item which is the update on doors open day which is now very much coming into view at the end of september um, and that will be dj hello everyone uh just a very quick update uh we're just in the last stages of um uh, sorting doors open days um we're up to about 100 venues or thereabouts but there's a few have been falling away in the last few days uh we're hoping that the 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 full programme will be available on Friday. Um, you'll find it all on coburnassociation.org.uk forward slash doors open days. Um, so if you just go to our new spanking new website and uh, you'll see along the top here, one of the, the main ones is always doors open days. This will take you to a page. Hopefully lots of you saw it last year, but it was all digital. This year it's a hybrid doors open days. So there, about half the venues are digital only and the other half are doing uh, live real world in-person events where possible regulations permitting and all of the caveats that go with it. Um, 
the page will look like it, it, it has the look and feel of a traditional paper brochure, but it's all digital. It's all uh, uh, available for you to use on your phone and ready to use. So here's here's one of the venues this year. Uh, what you do when you're landing the page is you you go to the um, if you if you are just looking for live in person you just filter by in person you can do it by geography you can do it by type of building that you like to visit you can do it by um, neighbourhood in Edinburgh or in East Lothian um, but in this case I've just filtered this by in person visits and this is one of the ones that popped up so this is a MacArthur store out in Dunbar uh, the page will have a little bit of history here. Uh, it'll have the information that you need for a visit in person. There may be an Eventbrite link will pop up here or, or another booking link maybe on their website because many of the uh, venues are participating this year. The only way you can go is if you pre-book um, and some of them sadly that does mean that spaces can be limited but don't be disappointed if you can't make it because every venue has provided some sort of virtual resource so you can visit them virtually um, and that's at the bottom of each page so there's a wee bit of virtual and this and these vary this is so in this case it's a nice uh, video sh uh, fly through showing you I won't press play because it'll mess with the bandwidth but um, you can uh, and I don't want to spoil the fun so I want you to visit them over the weekend and um, uh, so uh, but, so it can be a film it could be a 360 degree Degree uh, virtual tour, Edinburgh City Cemetery, uh, the department, in the council's cemetery department have done some wonderful, they've worked with a company called Capture Realities and they've gone around all of the city cemeteries many of the buildings um, and civic buildings and they've, they've scanned the interiors so from the comfort of your own home you can visit these sites and you can uh, have a tour of them from your own from your own home so all of that will appear at the bottom in the visit virtually section um, so all being well with a good following wind this Friday, this will all go live. Uh, if the last of the venues come back to me, even during this call, I've been answering venues who've been getting in touch. Uh, uh, so uh, hopefully it'll all be up. Keep checking back if you, if, uh, because all the way up to um, the, the 25th and 26th, I suspect I'll be adding more. I'll be changing and editing. I might be re uh, removing some, or I might be changing depending on where the regulations lie. It may be that, for, uh, if, if at the moment, uh, it may be that some of these uh, sites are feeling more. Um, confident that they won't have to do uh, uh, booking, but I, I suspect many of them may change to booking only. But just keep checking back to see. On this, though, you'll also find on our on our uh, web page now we have this new section wearing our Edinburgh Civic Trust hat. Um, uh, we've got a, 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 a calendar uh, of civic heritage events where you, as, as local community groups, can get in touch, send me an email, and I'll add your event. If you've got a public event, a public meeting, something that comes in these sort of rough categories here, um, and we'll add them up, and you get your own page. We just need a, a photograph, a booking link, some information. Does it cost? Does it or, or not? Uh, and uh, you'll get your own page um, uh, so that people, you can you can you can um, uh, advertise your event to all of our. Uh, uh, stakeholders, really useful tool. Hopefully you'll all uh, use it, uh, but you'll also find all of the events that are uh, in the lead up to Doors Open Day that some of the uh, venues are doing, these will all be advertised on here as well. Uh, I think that's that's me for that Doors Open Day's update. If anybody's got any questions. Yep. Stunned silence, everybody wants their dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think what DJ just said as well is this functionality on the website of any way for us to be advertising events. So if any of you have something that you're putting on that you'd like to share widely, then we can advertise that kind of for you through our own kind of web page and even particular things through the planning service that you wanted to have another outlet for it, let us know and we're very happy to kind of post, yeah. um, you know, any consultation, you know, meeting dates on that, uh, thrilled to do so. And, and you know this this will go out to our regular update to our own members, but it also we have a we quite a lot of web traffic or visiting is because of the other things that are on our website, our consultation responses, and other things. So it's a very useful way for you to advertise a local community event anytime, not just during doors open days. So that that's that's a new service that we'll be offering you free of charge. And just while we're discussing forthcoming events, as it was saying something about tomorrow night. Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, tomorrow night, in fact, I'll just show you again. Well, uh, tomorrow night, we're gonna, we've got a lovely, uh, our next Coburn conversation with uh, uh, international renowned urbanist Nicolas Bouchard, who's going to be talking about sustainability in Paris and uh, how, uh, what a, few, uh, a city should look like in Paris and, and what lessons and what inspiration we can draw uh, uh, for Edinburgh. So he's going to be in conversation with our 
uh, chair uh, cliff tomorrow evening from seven that event's free there's still a few tickets left um you'll find that on our events page if you want to click over there now I won't show you I'll put the link in the chat in a second once I've stopped talking and then you can click that and you can book uh book yourself a ticket for tomorrow evening yep and that's seven o'clock tomorrow evening yeah, yeah. tomorrow night okay. and we, we 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 had an interesting pre-discussion um yesterday about it and I think it'll be a some really interesting kind of parallels and issues probably there you go get your tickets okay thanks uh, are we to any other business? Is it? Yeah, any other business? Don't see any other business. And so the date of the next meeting is set there um, with the caveat, as mentioned earlier, subject to progress with the city plan that we, we will probably, I think it's more likely than not, that we'll have some event between now and then, especially focused on city, city plan 2030, which uh, as I think is very clear from our discussion tonight, is a really crucial document that uh, will shape the pattern of um, the city over the next decade and is pretty critical to the achievement of the uh, zero carbon aspirations that we've also talked about. So at that point, I just thank everybody who's come along. Particular thanks again to the team from the who's made it possible. Um, wish you all a good evening and hope perhaps to see some of you tomorrow night uh, as a citizen of Paris and uh, uh, an urban planner uh, who's worked there and, and internationally. And if I can get to so, put our special thanks in to kind of Beth Hall for kind of joining us. That was that was very informative and useful. And David is always and a little bit of business to note is um, as the country begins to or continue or may not uh, move its way out of lockdown, depending on how you take it, what kind of events and rollouts. Um, I, and I just kind of assume in looking at the meeting to see if any otherwise, I assume that kind of four members are content for us to continue to, to have our next few events digitally rather than to attempt um, a face-to-face -face meeting. Would that be, be a fair yeah. assumption? Okay, I think. Happy with that, yeah. Excellent, good. Thank you very much for that. Okay. And um, have a good rest of your evening. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks Everybody. very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thanks.